How's everybody doing out there? Long time no see. Um, it has been quite some time since um, we've seen each other, since I've put out a video. The last video that I put out was actually the end of April. I did record uh, one in May, but I didn't particularly care for it. And I was honestly going through a little bit of a, a time um, for a few months. You know, I was feeling a little down, a little depressed. I was feeling a little disillusioned about some things. Um, I had to do some reconsidering, some self-evaluation. <clears throat> and, you know, that happens in life, right? It's all part of growth. and um, I took the summer off to enjoy it. I love summer. Summer is my jam. I am a better, happier person when I'm tan. Not going to lie. Um, and we've been traveling a lot, um, house hunting and seeing new things, um, you know, enjoying each other's company and having friends over. And, you know, so it's not like it hasn't been without merit and, you know, good times. So um, it's been a good summer. It just went by too fast, as it always does. Um, but here I am again, and it is, uh, I revamped the title. Um, it's no longer going to be uh, the redeemed life. Um, that was kind of a play on, a my old blog. Um, but we're going to start anew. And so now the series is going to be called unveiled. And, uh, so welcome back. It's good to see you all again. Um, so my so the last video I put out, like I said, was the end of April, and that was right before my book came out and was published, and that um, was published beginning of May, The Deconstruction Diaries. And um, th that book was um, my two-year journey through deconstruction, right? Deconstructing my faith, Christianity, churchianity, um, religion, um, and, and it's all seen through my journaling because, you know, being a writer, I'm a big journaler. I journal everything and it's, I, I just feel like I think better through my pen sometimes. And, uh, so I figured since that came out and that was what my book was about, why not talk about deconstruction and, uh, what it is versus what it isn't. Um, so I know that the word itself is a buzzword, right? Deconstruction. And I'm sure many of you have heard the stories about, you know, big Christian names who've deconstructed their faith or turning away from it altogether and denouncing it, really, in general. Um, maybe you've heard warnings and criticisms coming from the pulpits, you know, some preachers even angrily denouncing this devilish deconstruction movement, you know, calling it dangerous, um, cautioning their flock about the heretics and the backsliders that are associated with this process. You know, asking were they even really saved then, if they can just walk away from church and their faith. And, you know, sadly, statements like that only serve to sow, like, fear and hatred and division into the hearts of the people who are listening to them and taking their word, you know? I also know that in the deconstruction community itself, that some people don't even like to use that word because of its connotations, the negative connotations, or maybe even because it has become so overused, you know, the buzzword. And I personally still find it absolutely appropriate based on the definition of the word itself. I'm a big word nerd. I love etymology. I like breaking words down and looking up their definitions, synonyms, antonyms, right? Getting to the heart of it because I think so many people just use words and they're not even aware of what they really are and what they mean. So let's break down the definition of deconstruction. Um, it means the act of breaking something down into its separate parts in order to understand its meaning, especially when this is different from how it was previously understood. It is a detailed examination of a text in order to show that there's no fixed meaning, but that it can be understood in a different way by each reader. It is the analytic examination of something, such as a theory, in order to reveal its inadequacy. That's probably problematic, right? <laughs> um, it also means analysis, breakdown, examination, evaluation, inspection, investigation, research, and study. So in looking at the definition of the word itself, I, 
I think it absolutely applies and it is perfectly appropriate to describe this experience. It's breaking down and analyzing, it's evaluating, it's investigating all that we have been taught and told is the truth when it comes to the things of God. Okay. But let's just be honest, that could very well be why a good portion of religion and churchianity have serious reservations with this movement. It's laying open and examining all the things that we have been taught and told and spoon-fed for years. It's analyzing decades, centuries worth of teachings and doctrines. And when we do, we find out it isn't at all what we were told that it was. You know, and the fact that people are turning away from these long-held doctrines and that they don't stand up under the scrutiny is alarming to fundamentalists, right? Because it not only calls into question what is being taught as truth, but then it's found that, you know, we find that it negates everything that we've stood on as truth. And more often than not, the result is people leaving the pews. And this is always a concern for church leaders for several reasons, right? Spiritual reasons, financial reasons, etc., etc. So, so there have been some that have reacted by publicly and vocally criticizing this movement and those who are a part of it, you know, driving home to anyone who will listen that this deconstruction movement is absolutely demonic at its core. And it sends the message that if you choose to take this path, that you are under Satan's influence, not God's, right? You're headed for destruction. Some have even called it the great falling away, right? That's prophesied about before the rapture. It's all part of the end times eschatology that's taught. Um, But either way, it's just fear-inducing. It's a fear-inducing message that they're pushing. But sadly, that's how churchianity runs, on fear. Now, I want to preface all of this by saying that I know not all pastors and preachers are venting about their disapproval of this movement right? Being vocal about it or angry and whatnot. But I'm willing to bet that many of them don't agree with this deconstruction process and that they do see it as a negative thing, especially if they're losing parishioners, if they see people walking away from fundamental evangelical Christianity, right? And I'm even willing to bet that a majority of them genuinely do care about their congregations, okay? Listen, let it be known that religion does harm pastors as well, okay? Not just the laity. There is an immense pressure on the pastor for the spiritual well-being of all of those who sit under them. You know, they live under this false sense of responsibility, crushed under the weight of perfection, of having to have it all together and on all right, or at least appearing like they do, right? They have limited close relationships. They're emotionally closed off. They got to have on their game face every time, you know, to meet the needs and demands of their people while they silently suffocate under the weight of their own ignored needs and wants, right? They live in self-denial most of the time. Any pastor, pastor worth his salt, you know? So, you know, why do you think pastor burnout and suicide is an issue? You know, they sit there, oh, it's the devil. No, it's religion because it puts one man both on a pedestal and under a thumb. So how long do you think that can last? It's sad. But this life is all that they know. This is why they are still stuck in this cycle and believing that churchianity is right and good and godly. You know, they are unwilling to step outside of that box, the building, you know, because this is their life. This is their identity. This is the truth. So they've been conditioned to believe that it has to be this way and no other. And then this belief is passed on down to the people, the believers, right? And that included me. I was absolutely a part of that for 14 years about tea break. So I know I mentioned before that from the very beginning, I was all in, right? Church every Sunday, studying the Bible front to back, teaching Bible studies, concordances, handbooks, you name it. I had hundreds of books, hundreds of books. Um, I believed it all. Spiritual warfare, 
penal substitutionary atonement, hell, eternal conscious torment, rapture, end times. I took it all incredibly serious. In a sense, I was a fundamentalist too, you know, of the charismatic spirit-filled branch. But I was always questioning, digging, searching. When I wasn't doing that, I was listening to some kind of teaching or sermon every single day, filling myself, right? I would be attracted to certain teachers for a set period of time. And then when their season was over, I just knew it. It was cut off. I couldn't listen to them anymore. And I just moved on to the next one that was brought into my path. But I never just allowed other people to feed me. I was personally sitting down daily with the Bible in my lap, etc. you know, and all of that coupled with Holy Spirit kept propelling me forward. Throughout the process, always, my prayer to God was, I want your truth, Lord, no matter what. And especially because I was teaching other people and I felt this huge responsibility towards them because the last thing I wanted to do was mislead them. That was important to me because Churchianity and Christianity teaches and preaches very heavily. There is only one way is the right way, right? You have to have it all right. So I just, I kept moving forward and growing in my beliefs. It was kind of like a, sh- a snake shedding its skin and, and to put it in kind of like that analogy, right? Leaving behind the old, outgrowing that skin a little at a time. That's growth. It's just for an example, for a quick example, like healing, right? I started out believing in the beginning that God could heal if he wanted to. Certain condition, conditions needed to be met. Maybe he's working something out of you. He's strengthening you, etc. Um, because that's what I was taught, right? Then I stumbled onto a teacher who taught that God wants to heal everyone all the time of everything, no matter what, no exemptions. That was huge for me. And that resonated with me. And then my beliefs in that area changed again, grew. Now where I'm at is a place where I believe that I am one with Jesus. I am connected to God, right? And so that means that that should manifest in my body and I should be living a life of divine health that we all should be. So growth process, it's progression as it should be. Um, But just know this, we see truth as we are able to receive it, right? There are times when we are not personally ready to hear and receive certain truths. God meets us where we are, reveals as much as we are able to understand and bear in that moment, in that season. Listen, if I had tried and <laughs> to see anything of what I believe now five years ago, I would not have been able to receive it, accept it as truth. I would have been offended by it. Trust me. I know me. I know what I was like. So all of my growth in the Lord up to the, that point, were really easy transitions. And by that, I mean, none of those transitions shook me to the core, right? It was just was to me a national, a natural progression of faith. But then a seed was planted about rapture. Now, even when I believed in the rapture, what bothered me about it was Christians walking around whining and complaining about how bad the world was. Oh, it's so dark and evil. And then follow up with, come Lord Jesus, <laughs> you know, that would make me so mad. And I would tell them, you are willing to relegate other people to hell while you're whisked away to safety. Could you be any more selfish? Like you're supposed to be the rescue mission and you're begging to be rescued. So anyways, so in about four years ago, I started studying out the rapture doctrine from a different perspective. and. In my conclusion, it's a made-up doctrine. I read a lot on this subject because I needed to be sure. This is a heavy hitter in the church, and I was fed heavy doses of rapture and end times eschatology for the first 10 years of my walk. I cut my teeth on it as a baby Christian, fed the milk, right? So to even consider for one moment that it wasn't true was huge, huge. But that right there, that seed, That was the beginning of my personal deconstruction process. Questioning the rapture doctrine was the thread, right? The thread that stuck out. 
And once I began to pull on it, the whole garment then began to unravel and pretty much everything else that I had been taught was true. That was God's infallible word, the foundation of Christian faith. I found out that it wasn't all that was cracked up to be and all that I was told that it was. You want to talk about unnerving? To find out that most of what you believed was true wasn't especially where God is concerned, right? And your spiritual life is major, major significance. Hell, eternal conscious torment, salvation, penal substitutionary atonement, rapture end times, the idea of church as we know it, it all came tumbling down brick by brick. It was both liberating and terrifying, honestly. Um, and, and by the way, I, if anybody is interested, I have a list of books that I read on these subjects listed on my website if you're curious as to what I read, if you want to read them yourself. Um, but here's the thing. Throughout this process, I did not lose faith in God. I didn't walk away from him. As a matter of fact, my relationship with him only grew stronger and deeper. I effortlessly entered into a place of rest with him by shedding all of the doctrines and beliefs that church had taught as unshakable tenets of faith. So those who deconstruct are walking away from God. Not all of us are, no. No, we are walking away from man's preconceived constructs of God. We are walking away from doctrine and theology and religion that blinds us to the truth of who God really is and who we really are. We are walking away from superstitious thinking and religious bondage that bathes us in anxiety. We are walking away from cult-like mindsets and attitudes and beliefs that make us fear and hate those who aren't like us, which keep us divided. From false beliefs that we are bad and evil and wretched, dirty sinners whose only worth is found when we say a prayer, and even then you have to keep up pretenses to stay in God's good graces. That's what we are walking away from. That's what I walked away from anyways. You know, and for those who do actually walk away from God, then it's most likely that their faith was in the system that failed them. You know, a system that was sadly ineffective and honestly and loving, lovingly representing the one true God as exhibited in Christ. You know, the Lord showed me that I had placed a good portion of my faith in religion and theology and doctrine and church attendance and all the dues of churchianity, but now I have fully placed it in the only one that matters, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Not scripture, doctrine, church, tithing, fasting, studying, praying. But see, that's what those who are firmly established in church and don't like about this. It drives people out of pews, out from under their persuasion. It's declining numbers. It's less people. They feel that they have failed as a spiritual leader to keep these people from falling away. And so... Then this deconstruction idea has been passionately denounced by some because the people need to be warned, right? So it begs the question, how many of those who criticize it have actually talked to and had a discussion with someone or many someones who are going through the process or have gone through the process to try to get to the heart of the issue, to see it from the other person's perspective? If they really cared, really, really cared about people's spiritual lives, wouldn't they seek them out, talk to them one-on-one -on -one, instead of making assumptions? My other question is, why are some pastors opposed to anyone inspecting, investigating, researching, and studying out these things for themselves? You know, preachers are always preaching, studying to show thyself approved, right? Well, okay, I did, right? But am I wrong because I am finding things that don't line up with what they're teaching? So is it that they actually mean for us to read, study, and interpret the Bible only the way that they teach and preach it? You know, what if our interpretation doesn't line up with theirs? What? You studied out rapture and now you don't believe in it while well, you're reading from wrong and deceptive sources. Someone actually told me this. <sighs> Have they never at any time done this themselves? read from deceptive or wrong sources? You know, are they personally immune? Are they exempt because they went to man's Bible school and got a God degree? You know, if anyone thinks for one second that anything that they have read or taught or 
it been taught or believed is to be true has been handed down by man, they've been deceived. Everything that we read and study, and it's all been handed down by man. It's man's source. You know, how are they so sure that everything they believe and teach is absolutely true? And I, I think it's arrogant for anyone to claim or believe that they have it all right and they, they know it, you know? A good portion of what is taught and preached from the pulpit is based on hand-me-down theology from other men. It is second-hand consignment shop faith. It's pre-worn. It's easy to put on. It's comfortable. You don't need to break it in for yourself. You just... It begs the question, is God too small to withstand the scrutiny? You know, why do we continually insist on tying him to a belief system that is strict and stringent, on keeping him contained within our self-prescribed rituals and routines? It will be this way and no other. Just questions that I have about this, you know? So a friend of mine sent me a couple of videos months ago um, of a preacher talking about this demonic deconstruction movement. So I sat and I listened to his three-minute denouncement. I took notes on everything he said. Um, and I'm going to break it down here for you what he said and share with you my thoughts and questions and comments um, on all that he asserted. I will not name names because, A, he's not the only person that is talking about this stuff, right? But it's more important that we tackle the mindset and the beliefs themselves, Okay. And again, like I said, not every pastor is saying this or believing this way or feeling the way he does. Okay. I'm just responding to this man's stuff. First thing he says is deconstruction is a tool of the devil. The old go-to when people start thinking, believing, and acting out of line, you know, with what is being taught and preached. It's beating people over the head with Satan, filling their hearts with fear. Do you know what fear does? It makes a great set of handcuffs because it keeps people shackled. They preach the devil is defeated and in the same breath tell everyone that he is a roaring lion and God forbid you step out of line because he's going to eat you for breakfast, pal. Magnify God, they cry, yet everything they preach tells a different story. According to them, Satan makes you sick. He takes over your thoughts. He steals your wealth. He causes or allowed is allowed to cause all sorts of problems in your life, right? Steals your wealth. You know, you stepped out of line and you need to be taught a lesson. So what is it, man? Is he defeated or is he running around helter-skelter, causing chaos and mayhem and destruction? See, when you stand back and you take an objective look, when you deconstruct and inspect all of these things, you see that there are many mixed messages and confusing dogmas floating around churchianity, but they always seem to come up with some kind of reason and defense for it. The devil is defeated, but you open the door. God healed you, but you got to do this and this to receive it. You are saved by grace, but you're not saved until you say a prayer. <laughs> you know? Oh, it's, hor it's horrible. I personally think that religion, fear, and confusion are tools of the devil. Because they all go hand in hand. Jesus came to set us free from all of that, right? And yet here we are, still living in the dark. The next thing this man said is, that this deconstruction removes you from spiritual authority. Okay, so now we're getting to the heart of the matter. So whose spiritual authority is it removing us from, man or God's? Because contrary to popular belief, they are not one and the same. Who gave anyone permission to hold authority over anyone in the name of God? Did God? Is that what God wants for people? This person also made the statement, that your influence with God increases when you demonstrate your humility by submitting to those God places over you. God places over you. To be humbly submitted to another man, bending to their will, hiding under their shadow instead of living in the light of Christ. Is that the best that we can do? And, and why should we be under this man's authority or any man's authority? Because they were called and anointed. Listen here, pet friends, let me just tell you, we've all been called and anointed. And the only reason that people don't know that is because of statements and beliefs like this, right? That we are to be under the thumb, I'm sorry, the authority of another for the sake of our spiritual health and well-being. Our very souls are at stake. 
The real truth has been obscured and neatly gagged, squirreled away onto the blanket of theology and spiritual disciplines and church authority. And I know that not all abuse that power, but there are many who do, sometimes intentionally, and some aren't even aware of it. It happens because it's human nature. The next thing this gentleman said was, it causes you to question everything. I love questions, he goes on to say. Questions are how you learn and discover. Smart people ask tough questions. But that's not an entirely true statement, right? That he is, that he's saying, be, you know, he, he's saying that people deconstruct and question their faith and what they're taught is wrong and demonic. So are there only certain questions that can and should be asked or allowed? What are the right answers? Are the, are the right answers the ones that line up with his conclusions that agree with him and what he is teaching that's right and true? What I want to know is why is it always about being right and versus being wrong? You know? Is this a test? Am I in school being graded? Because it's what it feels like. You know, how much do you know? How well do you learn? Did you pass the test? It's always pressure. You're always under a microscope. He goes on to say that the whole mindset of deconstruction is, I'm going to unravel everything that has been of value to me in the Christian world. Deconstruction is one of the greatest tools of the devil. There it is again. Because it takes you away. It adds very little value to your life. So does he mean to tell me that the only way for me to add value to my Christian life and that my value as a Christian only comes from going to church, tithing, reading the Bible, praying the way people tell me to pray, believing what they tell me to believe, that outside of all of those Christian-y things, I or you have no worth? Or that there is no worth to be found in anything other than these prescribed things? How does he know that it adds very little value to my life, to your life? That's a very presumptuous statement. Maybe what he means to say is that it adds very little of what he values to other people's lives. See, something only has value when it has been ascribed value. You cannot force people to value what you do. That's coercion. And for anyone to say that I do not value God because I choose not to do it the way I'm told to do it, it's audacious. And by the way, my value and worth was found and revealed to me after I walked away and deconstructed my faith and threw out this process. Because up until then, I didn't feel like I had any unless I prayed just the right way, studied just this much. Okay? God showed me my value was in him, not in those things, not in my Christian faith. He goes on to say, you may sense or have that level of freedom. I've never been so alive. I don't feel pressured to get up and go to church on Sunday. Okay, so there, there it is. The elephant in the room, no compulsory or required church attendance. Why does it always come down to that? Because church is a business. It is an industry. It is an institution where the select few preside over the masses, where one gets to be the voice that everyone listens to and heeds. And you know what? He is right. I have never felt so alive or free being out from under the thumb of religion, right? Living in the light of Christ and the love of Christ. But this is exactly what churchianity and religion do not want. See, after God led me out of church and religion, then I was free to hear his voice, to cultivate an honest to goodness relationship with him. And then he was able to bring me the healing and wholeness that I was desperately seeking. Listen, I was a broken girl. I had a lot of dysfunction in my life, okay? And this deconstruction process wasn't just about deconstructing faith and religion. It was an all-encompassing work, okay? God deconstructed every lie about myself that I believed, okay? He healed lifelong wounds and heartache. He rid me of wrong mindsets and self-defense mechanisms that were fabricated out of pain and rejection. He made himself more real to me than ever. And once I was made whole, I had no need for that brand of religion and churchianity any longer. And that's the problem. I personally see religion as a constant application of band-aids placed over gaping infected wounds, trying to cover up the ooze and stink and festering decay of our souls instead of actually getting them healed. 
See, religion wants you to be tangled up in knots. It requires you to stay broken, to remain twisted, so that you can stumble up to the stage every week while they play Come to the Altar, and you can throw yourself face down while you weep and cry, and your tears stain the carpet. I've been there. I've been there. Week after week. Okay? Then you can go and receive your touch and your word and your blessing and benediction from the hands of another man who is himself imperfect and flawed with his own struggles and temptations and weaknesses, but who will never let on reveal them to anyone. But we look up to them like they are some spiritual giant with access to secrets and revelation that we are unable to unlock. You know, the religion system doesn't elevate you. It holds you down in your brokenness. It encourages the idolatry of men Instead of showing you that you are one with Jesus Christ, that you are inseparable, that you are light and life, that you are free, that you too are a spiritual giant, and there is no mediator between you and God needed at all. How liberated would we all live and be? Should we just grab a hold of that truth? The next statement he makes is very telling as well, still talking about the deconstruction process. I don't have the pressure to be holy or pure. So do you mean to tell me that I need to feel pressured to be holy and pure, that I need to feel that pressure? And what's his definition of holy and pure? Is it me being sweet and kind and loving, coming to church every Sunday, reading the Bible every day, praying every morning and evening, not swearing or smoking or watching certain programs, listening to K-Love? Once again, it's behavior modification, and all of that is sin-focused. It causes you to constantly try and strive and toil to do and be and act and speak right under the microscope, weighing, evaluating ourselves, others. And it's only a matter of time before we slip up, right? And then that's when we can stumble up to the altar, cry our repentance out and apologize and beg forgiveness, right? Because I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Religion does not want you to know that you are already holy and pure. It has nothing to do with what you do or don't do. But it's because he is, he is holy and pure, and you are one with him, period, end of story. And if we actually got that, got that, then that would transform us from the inside out instead of us trying to do it from the outside in. He goes on to say that this deconstruction process, it is a tool of the devil. That's three times, I think, that he has mentioned it's a tool of the devil. Satan, Satan, Satan. Sorry, (laughs) I was being a little sarcastic there. It is a tool of the devil uh, that the devil is using to undervalue significant kingdom relationships. At the top of the list, there is a very significant kingdom relationship with your local church, not your church online or watching a YouTube or watching a YouTube podcast which I just want you to know that this is where I watched these videos of this man was on a podcast on YouTube. I'm just going to leave that there for you. Once again, he mentions going to church, driving home the point, church, church, church. Yes, kingdom relationships are being undermined because the ones who go through this deconstruction process are being ostracized, criticized, shunned, excommunicado. They're considered dangerous enemies. Therefore, to be avoided, chastised, scolded. And of course, all this is done out of concern for the spiritual welfare of the people. But in actuality, this negative rhetoric only causes further division. He says there is nothing positive about it, deconstruction. It is stripping us away from our foundation. Yes, sir. Yes, it is. It stripped me away from the foundation of man's authority, bad theology, false doctrines, religion, and forced devotion that kept me in bondage and restrained. It kept me from living the Christ in me life. See, if we are truly unified with him, if we know what that really means and looks like, then no man will ever again be able to influence, hold persuasion over us, and we will never again relinquish control to someone else. And that, my friends, is the real threat. To me personally, I think it takes a lot of cojones for anyone to think they have the right to tell me or anyone who and what and where and why and how, what's right, what's wrong, what's good and what's evil, what this means, what this scripture means, how I should live my life. Like, isn't that God's job? Holy Spirit's? 
is this is this man more worried about people believing right or believing what he tells them is right? And why, here's my question, why should God be tied to a belief system? Why have we tied him to a belief system? Remember what I said, fear equals handcuffs, and we have been bound to a belief system, and that is the power of religion. It's being tethered to doctrines when we should be free to live and know God as he wants to be known. And that's the issue. We have spent too long trying to be right, stay right, covering up our pain and our wounds, pretending we know it all. We have it all together, false faces. That's why I named this Unveiled. No more false faces. We've been hiding behind rituals and disciplines, twisted scriptures, and this has all caused us to miss out on him, okay? And this includes pastors and leadership, not just the laity. It has kept all of us from being able to tune into his voice, his heart, his frequency. We have been missing out on God because of this. Religion, have-tos, lists, rules, laws, instructions, elevating doctrines and traditions and men over God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. And this is the very definition of idolatry. Isn't God the whole point? Or is it just people using God as a platform? Right? Spellbinding people with that whole thing. That's a whole other issue. Anyways, I've said a lot, and here's the bottom line. Here's the question you want to ask, okay? Do you want him or do you want to remain in the familiar comfort of your belief systems? What's more important to you? This is for you to figure it out and answer. I can't answer that for you and I can't tell you what to do. And this is the main crux of deconstruction. It is not demonic. On the contrary, it was God who led me away from all of the religious noise and showed me his true face and heart. And thank you, Jesus. I am free. Isn't that what he died for? Listen, we cannot allow fear to run our lives, to dictate our actions and our beliefs. God did not create us for that. And all fear does is shield us from his truth. I know it's scary to think about leaving behind the comfort and familiarity of all that you've known, right? Especially where God and spiritual issues are concerned. But I promise you, He is ever with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. You cannot be separated from his love, from him. And I'm, I'm glad. I am so glad that I heard and that I listened to him because now I am finally learning what it means to know him, to live unified with him, to see myself as he wants me to see me, true me, real me, not the false me. He has taken away that veil. I am unveiled and seeing myself for the first time in my life. It's beautiful and wonderful and amazing. It was the best thing that has ever happened to me. So I just want to encourage you. Be free to know him. Come alive. Wake up. Be unveiled before him face to face with your creator. Okay? Cast off the handcuffs of fear and run. Run to him. Nothing will be more than worth it, right? Than to finally be with him face to face. It is absolutely transformational. And for any of those who are starting the process, curious about it, or um, my book, Deconstruction Diaries, like I said, is my two-year journaling process um, through it all. Um, So if you need any encouragement and curious about it, you can grab a copy on Amazon. You can go to my website. and. Just don't be afraid. God is with you. God loves you. I love you. And I just pray that you would be unveiled before Christ, that you would see him and yourself and everyone else as we truly are, that we are love and that we are light and that we are free and that we are one with him. God bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus Christ.